Here at The Damage Report, we've done quite a bit of coverage on the effects of the Me Too movement inside of the US, but its effects do not actually stop at our own borders. And joining us now to help break down the international ramifications is writer for Times, Suyin Haynes, who joins us now from Hong Kong. Welcome to the show. Hi, John, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, and thank you for staying up as late as you are to join <laughs> us on the show. We really do appreciate that. Not a problem. <laughs> so uh, we, as I said in the intro, we talk a lot about the Me Too movement inside of the country you know, from which it spawned, but it has actually spread to other parts of the world as well, correct? Yes, yes, that's correct. Um, I think it's important to note that it's taken on a lot of different forms around Asia, um, from you know, women in Thailand speaking out against slut shaming, from uh, women in Japan talking about the kind of uh, effects of the uh, discrimination in the workplace. And in um, the story that I co-authored with my colleague Arya Chen at Time as well, we look at China and South Korea as two kind of examples and two case case studies of how the movement has blossomed in different ways um, in these two countries. And I guess I should give the caveat, I don't want to take away the agency of the activists <laughs> working in these countries, that, that it was sort of picked up in many cases by groups, primarily women, who had been operating to try to bring progress in these areas for, for quite a long time, correct? Yes, that's completely right. Um, it's important to note that although you know, women in Hollywood and the kind of what we know now about Harvey Weinstein, et cetera, was, uh, it did inspire some women to speak out in Asia, particularly Soji Hun in South Korea, who is one of the main characters of our story. Um, a lot of women's activists around the region have been working for these kinds of changes for a really long time and have been waiting for this kind of opportunity to use me too, as we know it, as a kind of vehicle to advance the own causes for women in their own countries that are very specific. So it's been a kind of long decades of long simmering tensions that have been present in uh, in countries like the Philippines, for example, um, where we've had you know, women's rights activists working for years to kind of advance the role of women in peacemaking. Um, also women in India, who female journalists who've been speaking out against discrimination in their newsrooms. So it's been a long standing thing. It's not kind of a carbon copy mm -hmm. of the Western uh, movement as we know it. And so uh, thanks in no small part to the Me Too movement inside of the US, uh, I think that we, we here have a far better understanding of how bad things have actually been. In, in countries like China or you know, South mm -hmm. Korea, how bad are, is the situation with harassment and assault and inequalities in the law and, and those sorts of things? Yes, I mean, it can be, it can be pretty difficult for you for survivors, honestly. I think there's kind of two main things to think about here. Firstly, is the kind of um, barrier, the challenges and the challenging environments they're operating in. So if we take South Korea, for example, um, where you have a very patriarchal system, a very patriarchal society with strongly entrenched gender norms present through a lot of different facets of life, but particularly in the workplace, particularly in legal institutions, legal frameworks that make it quite difficult for survivors to get the kind of justice um, that, uh, that they need. Um, and to get the kind of support from law enforcement as well. And then in China, if we think about it, um, it's quite a different environment. Uh, obviously, it's an authoritarian state where the freedom of the press and freedom of information is, is very limited. And that was what was so crucial, I think, to uh, the kind of blossoming of Me Too in Hollywood, where the investigations by The New Yorker and The New York Times were really instrumental in uh, showing us what we know now. That doesn't really exist in the same way in China at all. So activists kind of have to contend with censorship, state surveillance, um, but have done so in very inventive and imaginative ways. Um, and that movement is largely organized online. So I'm very glad that you brought that up because obviously the, the, the ability to organize and protest and all that mm -hmm. is very different. So uh, you talked about uh, inventive ways that they've come up with, in particular in China, to get around some of these sort of societal and governmental restrictions. Um, mm -hmm. What are some examples of those? Sure, um, that's a great question. So some of the ways that activists that we've spoken to as part of the report have told us are um, using symbols to, instead of words to describe what they mean. Um, hmm. In Mandarin, right, uh, me too, kind of the sounds translate to the phrase rice bunny. So using the emojis of a bunny and a rice bowl um, to disseminate <laughs> that information, it's quite inventive. Um, also using quite advanced things like blockchain and um, that kind of technology and coding as well to get the message out there. 
there. So it's kind of the movement is uh, one activist told us that it's a uh, countless voices, nameless voices echoing each other. And I think that's really important um, because sometimes state censors will delete posts and I'm constantly monitoring um, for any mention of you know, feminism, women's rights, harassment, Me Too. Um, and sometimes posts will get deleted within a matter of hours. And so it's these network of volunteers that are so instrumental in reposting and sharing each other's stories and coming up with different ways to do that. Mm -hmm. And so in some of the countries that you talked about in your piece on time, has there been success yet in actually mm. bringing to some form of justice high profile individuals? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, just last week, um, the protagonist of our article, Soji Hun, she was a top level female prosecutor in South Korea. She had a high profile interview in January last year. Just last week, the man that she alleged um, she had, had brought her claim of harassment against, he was sentenced to two years in prison. But it's quite interesting to note that the terms were on, um, the sentencing was on the terms of abuse of power rather than like sexual harassment or sexual mm -hmm. abuse. And that kind of brings into focus the complexities of South Korea's legal system. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh no, uh, continue. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, another example in South Korea, um, they've just recently launched a wide scale um, investigation into abuse in sports. So um, the speed, the Olympic speed skating team, a, a wave of women spoke out about abuse they'd suffered at the hands of their coaches. So that's um, another really good example of how this kind of has really brought into focus the injustices that women face on a daily basis. Uh, that that's that's very good news to hear, and uh, obviously, you know, there's there's some pushback in the U.S. against the movement, mm. which is unfortunate to see. It's good to see that outside of the U.S. there is also um, you know some progress in the right direction. Yes. Uh, Suyin Haynes, thank you so much for joining us. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, and thank you. Uh, get some sleep. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>